Gospel of St. John and rest on your feet as you go to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15. Wait till I come off this thing. <laughs> I can tell you I got my I can walk around here. <laughs> so y'all get right, I might walk next to you. <laughs> and Dwight's like, we haven't been in the video nothing. <laughs> Don't walk around. <laughs> I told you. Yeah. We're gonna start at verse six. John 15, verse six. And the Lord's talking to his disciples and he says, If a man abide not in me, mm -hmm. he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. But if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. The word of the Lord is blessed. You can take your seat. Amen. Good morning, Great Bethesda. The Spirit of the Lord is here, so we already know. So I, I, I bid you all good morning. And I wanted to take this time, firstly, to welcome our visitor, praise the Lord, Amen. and to thank, come on, put your hands together, Amen. and to thank the Greater Bethesda family for coming out to Ridgely the other Sunday. Yes. I wanted to give yourselves a hand, give yourselves a hand, Amen. We did, uh, you, as you all know, Minister Polk is uh, very much involved in the uh, Geraldine Russell ministry in Uganda. And uh, it does, uh, uh, did his heart good. He wrote, he sent a little note about how pleased he was to see his church family there. Yeah. And y'all don't know how pleased I am to hear him say that he was pleased. Yeah. Because it means we are family. Right. Right. We are family. And we have to come and support each other right. in the things of God. When God is calling us into various facets of ministry, it's much more than just standing up here. That's true. Amen. Amen. And when God calls us, so we want to be there. And it's a sign that we're there as a, as a support to one another. Amen. And the voices of Bethesda. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, and, and weren't you impressed with what, what uh, they were doing in Uganda? Yeah. Amen. 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 I, I, I'm very, very impressed. Now, I've heard of these things last year, but every time I hear about it, not a lot of people. That's right. It's not like it's not like fifty of them, a hundred of them. Yeah. A few of them have done mighty things. Yes. Yes. God, because it don't take everybody; it just takes a few dedicated somebody. Right. Amen. Amen. And we're going to be talking about in the future, uh, world the the uh, compassion network. What's called, mm -hmm. uh, and, and our outreach efforts uh, to show love lived around the world. Because we need love lived in Uganda, we need love lived in Clinton, we need love lived over Alabama quarters, we need love lived in Kenya, we need love lived everywhere that we can get it. And so God is going to provide and open up opportunities for us to show the same love around the world and an opportunity is going to be uh, presenting itself soon. So uh, you're going to hear some more about that uh, at, a at a later time. But the message today... Came, I was talking to a brother of mine who had just come back from a cruise. He and his wife had gone to the Caribbean somewhere and they had been on a cruise. And so I said, man, I ain't seen you. How you been? And he was telling me about the cruise and he said, he and his wife were having a happiness hangover. <laughs> right? I know y'all saying y'all know what a hangover is. So it's like some of them. <laughs> Those of us who was not always saying <laughs> He said he was having a happiness hangover. And now we know that that's not the real name of it. But I remember going on a cruise. And when we was on a cruise, I could understand what he was talking about because when you're on a cruise, they feed you whenever you want to. <laughs> they bring food to you. Right. If you want, I, that's how I know, BJ can eat hamburgers three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right? Pancakes, sauce, whatever you want. Right? And, 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 and so when you get home, that's not available. <laughs> it takes a few days because you've been you've been just taking advantage for all this time. So now you get home, you're like, um, where the where the pancake? <laughs> Ain't nobody make up my bed and put the little doll on it, the little towel stuff on the thing. Wait, what? And and so I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me about this happiness hangover? It's it's a real thing, y'all, in the brain. It's a real, there's there's five parts of your brain. 
that when they receive neurotransmission, they release a drug called dopamine, right. which right. makes you feel good. There's five right. areas of your brain that do that. And you can imagine what they are. Mm -hmm. But man is the only animal that releases dopamine for higher order thinking. Every other animal is happy when their needs are met. That's right. The need to mate is met. The need to eat is met. The need to protect territory is met. These kinds of things. When you, when the, the lion's only happy when he's eating. <laughs> right? So, so he might make noise. And for all, I, I was debating whether to talk to my pet owners. <laughs> Praise God. To my, that didn't honor my, my Bethesda Groovers. Praise the Lord for our decisions. Please forgive my tardiness. Amen. I'm happy to be here. But, but, we got pet owners, see, see, some of my pet owners, I'm, I'm going to walk right, I don't know who got pets out here, but praise the Lord for you. <laughs> At my job, we have, I have some young millennials who have pets instead of children. Uh -huh. yeah. And they think the two are the same. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, it's my cat's birthday. <laughs> That's got a birthday. Good. We're having a party. Did you know that yesterday there was the running of the Chihuahuas? It cost $150 to enter. Fifi would have been in that yard. Fifi, you got it. I was Fifi, you got it. Right there on his face. But that's just me. Uh, the, the, the idea of Higher order thinking is what separates animals from humans. The idea that there are other things that should make us happy besides our survival needs. That's a very human concept. And, and, and I gotta bring it down. In 1980, there was a guy named Dr. Let me get his name right, I'm sorry. Dr. Richard Solomon from the University of Massachusetts. And he came up with an idea called the opponent process theory. We talked about the happiness angle for one second. The opponent process theory. And that says that our brain wants to stay even in a, a, a position called homeostasis. Or what they call like the Goldilocks setting. You know Goldilocks, not too hard, not too soft, right, just right. Right, right. right. So we want our lives to be just right. We don't want to be too happy, we don't want to be too sad, we want to be just right. And if anything sways it one way or the other, then our brain tries to overcorrect to bring it back. Right? And, and it makes sense, it, ma it makes sense, because evolution has, has determined that we need to be in the middle. Right. We can't be too happy. Because if you're too happy, then you don't notice when danger comes around. Right. Right. Huh? You can't be too sad, because if you're too sad, then you don't know when it's time to go hunt and eat. Right? So you got, in order to survive, we, we have to stay, amen, somewhere in the middle. And, and so he says, we have this opponent process <clears throat> theory. Now, we understand it when it goes from sad to happy. All you have to do is look at roller coasters. Most of us, if you like me, you get scared on a roller coaster. And you're scared on the way up. Oh, you looking at, oh! Then on the way down, you're like, ah! Let's do it again. Right? Because the sadness and the fear turn to invigoration, the opponent. Right? And so we kind of get it why people jump out of planes and then they're invigorated, right? Then she's like, I ain't jumping out of planes. But, right? We understand this idea of going from sad or fear to jubilation. Right? But we have a hard time going from happy to sad. Mm -hmm. When it goes the other way, we tend to have happiness hangovers. Uh, some of y'all, I'm too young, praise the Lord, to remember this. So maybe some of y'all can help me. In 1964, my brother was alive, my brother, not me. There was a woman on Stax Records named Wendy Renee. And she had a top 20 billboard hit said, after the laughter comes tears. Right. And it says, the, the, the lines from the song, one of the sentences goes, when you're in love, you're happy. When you're arm in arm, you gaze. But oh, you should remember that this don't last always. Because after the laughter comes tears. 
And so God began to talk to me about after the laughter. He said, what do my children do? Do they understand what happens after the laughter? Or do they have happiness hangovers? Amen. The sermon in the sentence I want to make sure everybody gets. Our condition with man does not reflect our position with God. That's right. Please, if you write something down, write that down. Our condition with man does not reflect our position with God. That's right. Now, now go back to the text real fast. Go back to the text. John, the 15th chapter of the text. And, and, and you'll see here he's talking with the Last Supper. Right? He's telling, he just told them that he must go. And that one of them was going to betray him. And in verse chapter 14, Judas has just left. Right? Satan put in his heart to betray him. He had just left. Right? And, and, and so he gets here and he says, the party's over. <laughs> Y'all, I, I know we've been true, we've been cooling, healing blind, opening blinded eyes, fishing loaves of bread. We've been doing a whole lot of stuff. We're pretty famous. Right? Y'all got a lot of shine off me. People are walking around. I know the girls looking at you like, you know Jesus? Give them my number, right? <laughs> <laughs> All of that stuff, right? So you got a lot of rebounds from me. But guess what? The party's over. Because now, now I must be about my father's business. Right. Now, I, I, all the other stuff was just a prelude to this. So all the fun you was having, now we have to do after the laughter. Oh my God. And they, they didn't understand. They, Peter and them didn't understand. What, what are you talking about, John? Like, what do you mean? And so, in verse 1, he says, I am the true vine. Oh, yes. My father is the husbandman. And it starts, we talked about vineyards before, but, but if you go back, Jesus knew the word. He was the word. So he knew everything that had ever been said. And he knew that way back in Isaiah, in the fifth chapter of Isaiah, that in Isaiah talked about the vineyard of God. Oh, yes. Right? And then he said that God had created Jerusalem to be a vineyard. Isn't that something? Right? That he put a fence around it. Yes, he did. That he had gathered and cast the stones out of it. But he had planted the most fruitful seeds in it. That he had even planted a tower in it and a wine press in it. But he goes on to say that the fruit was sour in yeah. Jerusalem. Yeah. Huh? And so he allowed the fences to be torn down and the seeds to be destroyed and all that kind of stuff, right? So he was saying to him, so, so that Jesus had to correct them and said that I am the true vine. Yes, yes, yes. What, what you're thinking of when I say vineyard is not what I am the true vine and my father in heaven is the husband. Right. And the, what I want to make sure you chew on this weekend or this week, John 15 and 2. Okay. He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Yes. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, now <laughs> he talks about being in me. Wait, I'm in the vineyard. You mean it's possible to be in the vineyard and not be in the vine? Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised what grows in a vineyard. Isn't that something? Everything that's growing in the vineyard ain't on the vine. Mm -hmm. It's weeds in the vineyard. That's right. There's tear in the vineyard. Everybody going to church ain't growing in the vineyard. Uh, every, I, I like to, to say everybody that's sitting on the premises is not standing on the ground. <laughs> oh, uh, there's a whole lot of people that just show up because it's Sunday. I just come here because it's near my house. I just come here because... Right? And, and, and so he's saying that the, I'm talking specifically not about those who are in the vineyard, but those who are in me. Yes. Uh, those who are saved and call upon the name of the Lord. He said, every branch that's in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's pretty straightforward. If it doesn't replicate God's plan, it gets removed. My God. Real simple. So at some point, y'all, we've got to stop playing with God. Yes, right. Because right. if God can't use you, then he don't need you. Need you. Amen. If he don't need you, <laughs> like Bill Belichick said, the more you do, the more you, do. the more you can do, the more you do do. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, but then the idea 
for Ed, I want you to think about. He says that every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. If, if you don't bear no fruit, then I remove you. But if you bear fruit, I purge you. That word purge is translated as pruning. Pruning, that's right. Huh. And so my message today would be after the laughter, the tuning of the pruning. Ooh, Jesus. Mm. Okay. Uh, so okay. I hear you, Lord. I hear you. He said the word the word prune is a verb. That's just to leave you. I'm glad she's a you're the vineyardess. Is there is that a real thing? <laughs> she got all these flowers. You go around her house, she got plants and stuff growing out. Doing things. Praise the Lord. But to prune is to trim by cutting away dead or overgrown branches mm -hmm. or stems, especially to increase fruitlessness and growth. Fruitfulness, pardon me, and growth. Uh, so, so if you ever see somebody pruning trees or pruning their garden, if it's a little thing, they take shears and they cut. Cut away the dead branches. But sometimes you gotta prune a tree. Big old things, you might need a whole saw mm -hmm. to cut. You might have to take an axe to cut it down. And so sometimes pruning looks violent. Sometimes pruning is painful. Yes. No, that's right. Huh? But but sometimes pruning seems destructive, but the purpose of pruning is to produce fruitfulness. Yes. Uh, it's not just so. So when, when he, that's why he says, "Everyone that's in me, I prune." Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. And sometimes that pruning is going to look violent. Sometimes that pruning is not going to feel good. It's going to hurt. But the purpose of why I'm doing it, my God, uh, it, it, it's to make you, Amen, to make you fruitful. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so he goes down to verse three. He says, "Now ye are clean." That, that word clean is katharos, meaning heart clean. Now you're clean by the words that I have spoken to you. Talk to the disciples now. They would ask him what you got to do, what we got to do. And he's saying, now your hearts are clean because I've had to prune you. Because uh, God is always going to prune before he uses. Oh my God, yes. He's always going to prune before you just saw it. In chapter 14, he had to prune the disciples away. He had to prune Judas out of there before he could use him. That's right. Right? And, and so, so we, we can keep going here. And he says, verse 4, abide in me mm -hmm. and I in you. Oh, yes. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide mm -hmm. in me. Yes. Now we talked about the word abide in the Bible study, but the whole Greek phrase abudmino means to awake continuously. Awake, wait for me, and I will wait for you. Mm -hmm. huh? And, and if you cannot survive unless we are connected and you continue to wait for me and I continue to wait for you. Mm -hmm. huh? so, so, it is only the word of God that prunes us. <laughs> And that there's no fruit, y'all got it, without Jesus. Write this down, too, if you're writing things down. The purpose of the vine is to create fruit. Mm -hmm. The fruit was to make wine. Mm -hmm. Right? Therefore, when the fruit falls off the vine, then it is taken to the wine press and turned into wine. Yes. So it is yesterday's fruit that makes today's wine. All right. Yesterday's fruit makes today's wine. Right? So, so don't get mad about yesterday because yesterday's fruit is what makes today's wine. Yes. Huh? The troubles of yesterday are what make the celebrations of today. Talk to us. Think about it. Think about it. Uh, uh, I believe it was Thomas Paine that said that which is most, well, that, that which is hardest to gain is most glorious to recall. Huh? So a whole lot of times we look back on the hard times that we've been through and the pain that we had to suffer. And we get stuck there. We say, Lord, why do I have to have bread? Why did it fall off the fruit? We're worried about yesterday's fruit. But he says, if you'll notice, I take yesterday's fruit to make today's wine. Yes. Huh? And, and so concern yourself, my God. Concern yourself with the wine. Huh? 
Now, I just throw this in for nothing. Verse 6 and 7. This is just because we are the church of God in Christ. Bishop Blake, we are holding this church. Verse 6 says, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. The men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You have the power and the authority if you abide in me. Real simple. Real, I'm not trying to trick you. If you stay with Jesus, you have power and authority. If you stay with Jesus, he will make the pathway straight. Right? If you do not, you will be cast out. Your plans will not work, so forth and so on. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. The whole point of it is so that you will bear much fruit. Amen. Now, now, I already told you all that the sermon in the sentence was that our condition with man does not reflect our position with God. I already told y'all that. But I thought, I looked back, and, and, and when we're out, a lot of us think that we're out of the will of God because we're after the laughter. Oh, Jesus. Wow. A lot of us think we did something wrong because we're after the laughter. Yes. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I don't know if you ever been at the party when the lights came on. Praise <laughs> 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 God. And, and what you thought you was doing, you was not doing. <laughs> what you thought was going on was not going on. In the light of day, you was not really. Right? You wasn't as cool as you thought when the light came on. <laughs> After the laughter, the reality comes back in to play. And many of us think that while God is moving in our lives and while we are uh, being used mightily all over the world and being used, that and as soon as that stops, we automatically think something is wrong. But God is saying it's during that time that I'm pruning you. Yes. And there's going to be harshness sometimes during this pruning. Oh, it is. Huh? No question about it. <laughs> because we say, Lord, the first thing most of us say, Lord, I was doing your will. Why did you stop? I, wait, I was doing everything right. Why did you stop? Huh? Now, 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 I need you to understand that the word, the text in 15.2 says that he only prunes fruitful vines. He only, he only does this to people who are actually producing. So if God is not pruning you, you need Mm. Over to James Madison Middle School, the principal says, when I stop fussing at you, that's, right. that's when you need to. <laughs> Y'all better get out this hallway. <laughs> as long as Miss King is fussing, <laughs> A, you know where she is. <laughs> Look, he's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know where she is. Uh, but when she stops fussing, and get you right in paper, get you right in black and white, calling your mother and, and having forms filled out. That's what it's, it's too late by that time. God is saying the same thing. As long as I, as long as you can feel me cutting on you, you know that you're still growing. Yes. Huh? It's when I stop cutting on you. When you no longer feel the pruning of your decisions, that's when you need to live. Lord, something is wrong here. Because God, I, I felt you push me in a while. I know I'm not that good. Yes, so I know, God, if you haven't had to correct me in a little while, I must, Lord, what's wrong? Let's check me. Check me again. Mm -hmm. Check. Are you sure, Lord? Check this. Right, right, right. <laughs> now, now, now. <laughs> because, you see, as I said before, God only prunes fruitful branches. Mm -hmm. he, he only allows haters in fruitful ministries. <laughs> <laughs> they only talk about you if you're doing something. That's right. Yeah. Huh? Who is that? So they can tell how great a man is by his enemies. Mm. The size yes. of his enemies. That's right. Uh, uh, wow. He only allows financial challenges to those who want to pay their tithes. Yes, oh, wow. yes. My 
You will notice, you will notice when you wasn't paying tithes, you didn't have all that compunction about paying money. But as soon as you start to pay tithes, now it becomes the but but understand that's all part of the pruning process. Yes, yes, yes. Huh? God will tap that purse just to see what you're gonna do. Jesus. Some of us get right personal when you tap our purse. Oh. Uh. <laughs> hold up, hold up, hold up. That's right. Huh? Want to get my attention, tap his purse a little bit. So God will tap your purse. And I, I can remember the late Bishop Archie D. Head used to say about tithing. Y'all remember that? He said it was like having a hole in your pocket. He said if you don't pay your tithes, it's like having a hole in your pocket. It don't make no difference how much money you make. It's going to go right out. Huh? So, so because the challenge, he will only challenge financially challenge fruitful. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. He only allows strife to come into marriages that are glorifying him. Yeah. Huh? If y'all, if, if nobody's watching how you and your husband act, then then everything's gonna be quiet between y'all. But as soon as he sees, as soon as the devil sees that other people are looking and saying, "Well, what does Deacon Mathis and Sister Mathis? I, I, maybe I should talk to them. Maybe we should talk to." As soon as that kind of stuff happens. Bow, they're gonna try to throw enmity right, between right, y'all. Because right. he only messes with, he, only, yes. he proves and turns fruitful things. My God. Uh, now, now, we tend to think that we do things wrong, that God punishes us. That's what we think. We think God acts like us. You do me wrong, I'm gonna do you better. <laughs> That's the way men think. And so we think God is like that. Yeah. We try to, instead of us trying to be like God, we try to make God like us. And we say, you know what? It, it had to be for, this This had to be for something that I did wrong. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. And, and, and so sometimes it looks like God is punishing us. I had this and now I don't have it no more. I was here, but now I'm not here anymore. And so I, the fact that I have moved or changed must mean that God is mad at me. And so this has got to be a consequence of God being mad at me. I tell him, when God is mad at you, you'll know it. Amen. It ain't going to be no secret that he's mad at you. Right? And, 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 and so some of the trials and tribulations that we go through that we think are punishment, God told me to tell you it's just public pruning. Ooh, wow. Jeez. We, we don't mind getting pruned in private. God fix me behind the closed door where nobody can see. But every now and then he's going to prove you in public. In front of everybody. <laughs> Will you call me out on my mess in front of the whole church? Huh? Will you put my, my, my situation, will you repossess my car? My God. And everybody see me at the bus stop when I used to be leaning. And all of a sudden, now I'm publicly shamed. <laughs> God had to prune my yes, Hallelujah. So what we're calling punishment, God says, is just public pruning. Mm -hmm. uh, but there will always be those he's looking for who remain on the vine after yes. the pruning. Yes. That's what he's looking for. Yes. And when, when he cuts away yes. to make you more fruitful, there will always be those. In Romans 11 and 5, it says, even so, and so even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant mm -hmm. according to the election of grace. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a couple left. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, hey. The devil wants you to think that there's nobody left, that he has been victorious, that he has wiped out everybody. I don't care what the situation is. always going to be a remnant left. Yeah, <laughs> and so when you feel like God has left you, and you're feeling the hurt of the world, you have just joined the fruity bunch. <laughs> That's us, the fruity bunch. You know, we, because we produce fruit, we had to lose this. Because I produce fruit, I had to lose that. And so all I did was I became a member of the fruity bunch. It hurt to get in there, but then you ask, why am I here? Because now you're in the fruity bunch. Because you produced, uh, uh, and, and then I look at the Bible, Rick, and I, I, the question that God asked, and I'm almost done, y'all, really. Uh, the same question that Jesus asked the disciples 
before they fed the 5,000. The same question that Elijah asked the widow at Zarephath. <laughs> the question is simple. Same question God is asking you to consider. What do you have left? He went to that middle woman and said, have you anything in the house? That's right. She said, nothing save some oil. <laughs> he said, he asked the disciples, what do we have here? He said, nothing but some fish and some loaves of bread. God always deals with what's left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he don't concern himself with what's lost. That's right, God. He concerns himself with what's left. That's right. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you have to understand. Yes. Yes. God don't move till the unnecessary has been discarded. Right. 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 Uh, right. He, he, he got. See, he not gonna bring his uh, relationship that glorifies him until your unnecessary relationship has been discarded. My God. He, he don't he don't bring you opportunities until what you thought was your resource has dried up. My God, that's good, Pastor. That's he wait he waits until you finish being so smart, <laughs> and let you, because he's a great teacher. Yes, he is. Oh my God. My God, he's yes. a bro. He's a distinguished teacher. Yes, he is. Pastor. He gets all the ratings. Yes, because the Lord will let you. A good teacher, see, he who does the work does the learning. And so sometimes as a teacher what you got to do is you have to let the student struggle with the answer. We quick to one of the but the but the good teacher is the one who walks and says now what's the problem Brian? Mm -hmm. Two plus two. Okay. What do you have here? Five. Is two plus two five? Two plus two and now some of us want to correct right away, but the good teacher will sit back right. and let you remember. He will let you remember what you have already done. He will let you remember the lessons of the past, and then you will say, "No, plus two is four. and you come to your own conclusion because he's a master teacher, and so he knocks sometimes. He has to let all of your answers dry up. <laughs> all the all the schemes that you thought, I'm gonna get this money, I'm, my man's and I'll be gonna flip it up. <laughs> He's gonna sit back and let you sit back and let you try and fail. Sit back and let you go back into the relationship. Mama said, leave him alone. He's already shown himself to be untrustworthy, but he called again. <laughs> So now, God will go ahead and let go ahead back there, and then we'll see. God has to let the unnecessary activities and the wastes of time that we engage in, let all of that be interrupted. And then he will move. Because God's only concerned with what you have left. Uh, it's critical, critical that we understand he's the God of what is left. If, if he took away 99 of your 100, then you only needed one. You have to trust that God is going to do what he was going to do with one, and that 99 might be too many. Ask Gideon. Gideon had a whole army to fight with if God said there are too many. Too many. That's right. What you mean, too many? He got all this? There's too many. Eight men thoroughly immersed. <laughs> Woo, I ain't gonna get into that part. But I, I tell you what, he don't need everybody, he just needs a few good somebody. That's right, man. And so God is waiting to prune the unfruitful off the tree of your life. The unproductive off the tree of your life. Some of the things he has to cut have your same last name. Oh my God. Ah. And you, you're not going to move them, so God has to move them. And sometimes the cutting looks violent. Sometimes the cutting looks unfair. Sometimes the utensil looks like it's, it's you know, destructive. But he said, i got to cut that situation away so that you will grow. You might not be invited to the next party. Fourth of July might come and go, and they didn't think so I come to you. Huh. And you might feel all alone, but notice God is pruning you. Because what he wants to deal with 
is what's left after the laughter. Now, now uh, I think about pruning. The thing about pruning that I forgot to mention, that I got to make sure that we know, when you prune, sister, <laughs> you can't prune in the springtime because it ain't no fruit. They just plant it. In the summertime, it's under the ground. Ain't nothing to prune. <laughs> in the wintertime, if you prune, you're going to break it in half because it's too dry. Too brittle. The only time or the optimum time to prune is in the fall during the harvest. Yeah. It is during the most productive time that God must prune you. My God, my God. We start enjoying the productive time. We love when, when the money's moving and everything. God is moving in us. Woo, 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 woo. We all, yeah, yeah, God, yeah, God, yeah, God. But it's at that time that I have to prune you. My God. It's right in the middle of when things is going good. I'm not going to prune you in the hospital. I'm going to wait till you feel good. Then I'm I'm not gonna prove you when you broke. I'm gonna wait till you got two nickels and a quarter, and uh, then I'm going to. Uh, uh, then I have to prune you. Uh, God, God. <laughs> the time for pruning is in the harvest, mm-hmm. and it's that. It's, that's why. That's why we kind of get in our feelings because right. when we're in the harvest, we think it's all good, and I don't understand God why you did this in the middle of the harvest. Well, that's the time that pruning is done. God. My God, my God. Oh, you see, uh, he wants to know if you'll give him what's left. That's all. God wants your what's left. Notice, he, he took the fish and the five loaves of bread, and he fed 5,000 and had 12 extra baskets and all that other stuff because the boy would give him what's left. Suppose the boy would have ate his lunch. Like they do now. I ain't giving my this my lunch. <laughs> Suppose he would have eaten his lunch. Suppose the widow of Zarephath would have decided this oil is insignificant and I'm not going to pour it out. Huh? Are you going to give him your what's left? Now that you've been pruned, are you going to give him what's left of your career? Mm. It didn't work out the way you thought. You thought you'd be the head bottle washer by now. And now you're not the head bottle washer. But since you're the assistant bottle washer, are you willing to give him the career you have left? Mm-hmm. That's all he wants. Where's God? My ears come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Are you willing to give him the rest of your reputation? Mm-hmm. Now that they didn't talked about you, they didn't called you everything, and sometimes they wasn't even lying. He really was. <laughs> Are you willing to give him the what's left of your reputation? Are you willing to give him what's left of your bank account? Now that I lost all this money, am I willing to let God move in the money that I have left? Huh? That's what he wants to know. Because remember now, when God comes and proves you, when he throws dirt on you, you're not buried. You're planted. Yes. Oh my God. God don't bury us. He plants us so that we might grow again. And all we have to do is focus on what's left after the laughter and the tuning that comes from the fruit. Stand on your feet. Amen. Amen. Amen.